Good morning, and thank you for joining me here at the Seventh-day Sabbath this morning. God bless you, and thank you for spending your time with me here today. Whether it's the uh, Seventh-day Sabbath uh, or whether you're listening to this in our archives, uh, I just want to welcome you either way and uh, say thank you for watching. Uh, today we'll be tackling a theology and or a doctrine that's completely 360 degrees away and apart from the Word of God in so many different ways that it's hard to even count. For those of you who don't know or have never heard of replacement theology, let me take just a moment here and try to give you a short description of just what replacement theology is and what its beliefs are. Replacement theology uh, essentially teaches that the church or the body of Christ overall has replaced the Jews and Israel as God's chosen people. There now seems to be two divided camps concerning the Gentile church and the people of Israel, or the Jews. One camp, or train of thought, is that the Gentile church has replaced Israel, and this is known as replacement or covenant theology. And the other camp, or train of thought, is that the church is completely different and distinct from Israel, and that is considered dispensationalism or premillennialism. Replacement theology teaches that when it comes to all of the promises of God, that the church has now replaced Israel. Replacement theologists believe that wherever you see the word Israel, that you can just take out the word Israel and replace it with the church, and that is no longer, uh, and that it no longer includes Israel and the Jews. They believe that the church gets all the blessings, that uh, it and Israel gets to keep all of the curses. Replacement theologists believe that Israel has no future in God's plan, they have no future in the land of Israel, and that prophetically it doesn't matter uh, that they've become a nation again after 2,000 years and have fulfilled the prophecies of God in the Word of God. Now, as long as Israel was not a nation, this theology and this way of thinking did fairly well because not many other than the Jews who studied the Torah knew or understood the prophecy that Israel would once again become a nation. You see, before 1948, there was no Israel. So the church assumed that the promise of our forefathers, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were meant for us, the Gentiles and that the Jews and the twelve tribes of Israel were now excluded from the promises of God because God had divorced her altogether. But when God restored Israel, as the prophecy said that he would, and made her a nation again back in 1948, those who studied the Torah or the Old Testament knew that he would. That kind of blew a hole in the whole replacement theology doctrine. But more importantly, Anyone who really reads their Bible can know and understand that there's been no replacement of Israel. Israel is the root of the olive tree that the Gentiles, the Gentiles have been grafted into. And we'll prove that to you as we move along here today. Now, when I say our church fathers, or, or say you hear of church fathers, or someone speaking of our church fathers, 
what names do you automatically think of? When you hear someone talking about the church fathers, uh, what names actually pop into your mind? I can automatically know and understand and, uh, and think of our church fathers as being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think of Rabbi Yeshua, also known as Jesus in the Greek. I think of Rabbi Sheol, also known as the Apostle Paul. I think of David, Noah, the Apostles, and our biblical church fathers. But some people have a different idea about who their church fathers are. When speaking of replacement theology, you'll often hear of people talking about other names, like Justin Martyr from back in 160 AD, who once said to a Jew, the scriptures are no longer yours, they are ours. Or they may be speaking about Arrhenius back in 177 AD, who was the bishop of Lyon, who wrote, the Jews are now disinherited from the grace of God. Or they may quote from Tertullian, from back in 160 to 230 AD, who wrote a treatise against the Jews, and then he announced that God had now rejected the Jews in favor of the Christians. Eusebius, back in the early 4th century, wrote that the promises of the Hebrew scriptures were now for the Christians and not for the Jews. But the curses were for the Jews, and he also argued that the church was the continuation of the Old Testament and that it superseded Judaism. And the young church declared itself to be the true Israel, or Israel, according to the spirit and heir to the divine promises. You see, the Roman Catholic Church has always been pining for authority for centuries, and she'll say and do almost anything to enforce her authority, uh, and the Reformers during the Reformation period were well aware of her power-grabbing wickedness. But even some of them were caught up in her web of deceit and her many lies and corruptions. And they found it essential to discredit Israel according to the flesh in order to prove that God had cast away his people and transferred all of his love to the Gentiles and the Catholic Church. So now 306 AD comes along uh, and we see Constantine. Now he was the first Christian Roman Emperor in 321 AD and we find that he actually created the lie of the Christian Easter which is and always has been a pagan holiday from its conception out of hatred for the Jews, because he didn't want the Christians to be following after the Jewish holy days. And so, if we read into history, we can find Constantine's writings concerning how he wanted to create a Christian Easter so that Christians would not be following after the Jews. And that's how and why the true dates and times of Passover or Pesach were all changed and rabbits and eggs were instituted into the festival and so on and so forth. This is all historical fact. It's right out in the open for anybody who wants to see and know. We all know that there's no such thing as Easter and Good Friday. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all agree that Yeshua died on Passover Day. Not some man-made, God-given uh, Good Friday, or ungodly Good Friday. In fact, we can go back and know that he died about 3 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon if we care to really go back and look. And you can find out more about that if you'd like by going to uh, the website at thevelainereport.com and looking under the Learning tab and watching uh, my video called The Abominations of Easter. But for time's sake, I want to stay on this course with how this replacement theology came to be. So as we move through this study, you'll find that all of God's true dates, times, holidays, and so on, were all changed by Catholicism and the Catholic Church, who declares her right to change whatever she wants, because she claims that her many popes are indeed the vicars of Christ, and they've essentially stolen the authority of Christ and even God himself in many cases in order to try and maintain their authority over the body of Christ and turn God's people away from God and back towards our adversaries pagan ways and traditions and away from the times and the dates that God gave to our real church fathers including but not limited to the Jews and of course everything from their pagan vestments and the clothes that they wear and their rituals and praying to dead saints and bowing down before idols and their skull worship and marching around the city with skulls on pillows all adorned in golden crowns and their pine cone staffs and sunbursts over their head, everyone's heads, 
and their crescent moon symbols and so on and so forth all point us to who they really are and what they really stand for. The book of Revelations has much to say about Catholicism in the 17th chapter, but again we need to stay on track with this replacement theology concept, so for time's sake we'll try and stay focused. Martin Luther, also considered a church father by many, who hung his 95 thesis on the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany on Halloween Day, how convenient was that, also was an anti-Semite who at first tried to win the Jews over, but when they wouldn't budge, and he realized that they weren't going to follow him, he turned on them and wrote this in his book called The Jews and Their Lies. And this is an actual book. You can Google it if you'd like to. Uh, it's easy to find. Uh, it's called The Jews and Their Lies. And he writes this in his book. He says, What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct now that we are aware of all their lying, reveling, and blaspheming. If we do, we become sharers in their lies, cursing, and blasphemy. Thus, we cannot extinguish the inquenchable fire of divine wrath of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert these Jews. And he goes on from there and then begins to give his advice as to what he says that they should do with the Jews, and uh, he goes on to write this. First, we need to set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. And this is to be done in honor of our Lord and Christendom. And he goes on to say this. I'd advise that their houses also be destroyed, for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Instead, they might be lodged in, under a roof or in a barn, like the gypsies, and this will bring home to them that they are not masters in our country, as they boast, but they are living in exile and in the captivity, as they incessantly wail in the midst about us before God. And he goes on and on and on about... Uh, taking their prayer books and burning them and not letting them travel and roads uh, and destroying the roads and taking all of their money from them and just basically treating them like slaves and even calls them mad dogs. So we can know and understand that Martin Luther was a mad anti-Semite with the intent to do everything short of murdering the Jews. Now. When we hear all this talk about church fathers, this and uh, the church fathers that, uh, I think it's pretty important to remember what the words in our red letter Bibles tells us. In other words, what the words of Yeshua says. With his own breath, with his own words, with his own tongue, when he said this in Matthew 23, 9. He said, And don't call anyone on earth your father, because you have only one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called teachers, because you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The person who is greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let me ask you this. How humbled does the Pope look as he sits in his throne of gold and his decrepit crozier staff in his hand and the pine cone embedded in it? Uh, that belongs to paganism, and his crowns of jewels and purple and scarlet robes all wrapped around him. Jesus said this in Matthew 23, 13. He said, How terrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door in the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You don't go in yourselves, and you don't allow those who are trying to enter in. How terrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! He calls them for a second time. You devour windows' houses and say long prayers to cover it up. Therefore, you will receive the greater condemnation. How terrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, a third time he calls them. You travel over land and sea to make a single convert, and when this happens, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. Pretty harsh words for the popish leaders of his day, wouldn't you say? Once again, the Bible tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. What's happening today has already happened. 
You can read that in Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is nothing new or different today than there was 2,000 years ago. The same Sadducees and Pharisees still exist in today's world. And we can know who they are if we'll just go back and look at our history books to match them up to Scripture. It was the Roman Catholic Church that said that the Jews cannot live among us as Jews. And being the biggest church in the world, the nations just fell in line with her, and the Jews have just been kicked around the earth for centuries. And all Hitler had to do was just fulfill what the Roman Catholic Church had already said, that the Jews cannot live among us. Now, for those who believe in replacement theology, and who believe that the Gentiles have replaced the Jew, and that God has divorced Israel altogether and all of the Jews, I want to turn to the Word of God and the written scriptures so that we can get a clear and unadulterated picture of what the truth is concerning this replacement theology. I want us to hear what's told in the scripture from Matthew 15, 23, 28. And I want you to think about what, uh, what you hear in this scripture. Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. But he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So what do we hear Yeshua saying in this scripture? Very clearly and very openly, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she said, it's not right to take the children's bread. He said, or Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to dogs. So what did he mean by that statement? Notice, it wasn't until the woman had proven her faith that she was counted as worthy to have her daughter healed. Yet, at first, Jesus wanted nothing to do with her. And I suspect it was because he was trying to, once again, teach his disciples why he had come and what his mission was. So he denies her request in front of them. And he says very clearly that I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. But when she falls at his feet in front of the apostles, and, he, and she says that even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, she automatically is grafted into the olive tree that Paul speaks about in Romans 11. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Once she confessed with her tongue, that she had the undying faith to believe in him and brought herself low before him and even before the house of Israel. She became part of Israel. And I'm going to prove that to you in Romans 11. So let's go there now. Now, we're going to take a look at the whole chapter of Romans 11. Uh, and it's not all that long, but it's every single Christian should hear, know, and understand what's being said in this scripture. So if you've never heard it before, please uh, take the time to listen to this. This chapter of the Bible is so significant and so revealing that it's just that important. Simply put, every Christian should have this in their hearing. And to be clear, this is the message that Yeshua came to die for on the cross, not just for the Jew or the Gentile, but for His church. And His church is made up of both Jews and Gentiles who were grafted into the olive tree of Israel. I'm going to say something very profound to you here today, and I, I hope and I pray that you can act, actually grasp what I'm about to say, and that you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and understand what I'm about to say. If you are a Christian, then you are a Jew. And if you are really a Jew, then you are a Christian. Now, I want to stop just for a moment, and I want to let that sink in just for a moment. Let's, let's just break that statement down for those who are getting a headache and uh, have just been short-circuited. Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, was a Jew. 
Your Savior came out of the house of David, who was a Jew. You are part of the body of Christ, who is a Jew, and came out of the house of Judah. They called him Rabbi Yeshua. Are we starting to get a clear picture of the first half of the statement? If you are a real Christian and part of Christ, then you already know and understand that you are a Jew. And we'll solidify that as we move through the scriptures and cement that in your mind and in your heart as we move forward. But I also want to address the last half of that statement. If you are a real Jew, then you are a Christian because you're already fully aware of who your Messiah is. So in order for a Jew to become a real Jew and accepted by God and become part of the Israel, he must have the knowledge of truth and have accepted Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek, as his Messiah. So once again, a real Christian is a Jew, and a real Jew is indeed a Christian. Why? Because they are one in the same. They are both the body of Christ, and they are both part of the olive tree known as Israel. So the question then bears, what is the olive tree? God has always referred to Israel as the olive tree, from clear back in Jeremiah 11.16. If we read Jeremiah 11.16, it says this, it says, The Lord once called you a green olive tree with beautiful shape and fruit. And we can go back to all kinds of scriptures that point to Israel as being the olive tree. But for time's sake, we'll just stop at this one example. Now, with all of that knowledge in our minds, we can now move into Romans 11 and better understand what's being said. So let's dive into the scriptures to prove that replacement theology is indeed a false doctrine, and so that we can know and understand through scripture that the Gentiles have not in any way, shape, or form replaced God's first love, who is and always has been Israel. Let's begin. Romans 11, 1. So I ask God, has, not, has God uh, rejected his people? Has he? Of course not. I am in Israel myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Now this is Paul speaking, and uh, he is speaking uh, to the Jews and Gentiles here. And there is a big conflict between, and a battle going on between the Jews and the Gentiles. And there is a certain amount of uh, Jewish, or a, or a Jewish sect called the uh, circumcision group. And they were following Paul around, always badgering uh, his new converts, telling them that they had to be circumcised and, and all this other kind of stuff. And there was a battle going on between these new uh, Gentiles that were being grafted into the olive tree uh, of Israel. So, with all of this conflict going on, Paul is now trying to get them to understand that they are all part of the olive tree, but that the Jews are the root of that olive tree. And it's important for the Gentiles to remember this. So, at any rate, we're going to go ahead and continue on. Uh, and we have to remember also that Paul, indeed, was a Jew. Okay, He was a Christian killer in the beginning before he was struck down in the road uh, in, on his way to Damascus. And that's when uh, Jesus knocked him off his horse, struck him blind, and said, Why do you persecute me, Paul? And then Paul becomes uh, an apostle. So this is a little bit of a history about the apostle Paul, if you did not know these things. So uh, again, Paul being a Jew, but he is an apostle to the Gentiles. And he says that uh, as we go forward. Let's listen to what he says. He says, I am an Israeli myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. But God has not rejected his people whom he chose long ago. Do you not know that the scripture says in the story what the what the scripture says in the story about Elijah when he pleads with God against Israel? Now I want to stop right here for those of you who don't know the story of Elijah. Now again, many people do not read their Old Testament, and if you do not read your Old Testament, you do not know the story of Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. Uh, it was one of the people in the Bible that God actually came down to earth and picked up. He did not die. He was taken by God. So again, Elijah, a very powerful man uh, of God. And if you remember in your Old Testament, for those of you who have read the Old Testament, uh, Elijah had done battle with the god Baal. And the Israelites were burning their children in the fire and worshiping this false god Baal. So Elijah came and he set two, uh, there were uh, two piles of wood and two sacrifices. He told the, the followers of Baal, you 
you set up a, a stack of wood and uh, sacrifice a bull. I'll set up a, a stack of wood and sacrifice a bull, and we'll see whose god can start the fire. And of course, the god Baal could not start the fire because there was no god Baal. It was a fake god. But Elijah had them dump water on his pile of wood three times, and there was a little river kind of going around the wood pile of Elijah. Elijah prayed once to God, and he sent fire down from the sky that completely burned up that wood, burned everything there, licked up all the water, and turned it completely into ashes. And then Elijah called for the priests of Baal to be eliminated. And they were. And there, of course, uh, this is a great big long story about what happened to Elijah. But the king, who hated Elijah and uh, was also worshiping Baal, chased Elijah uh, in his chariot. Of course, Elijah outran the chariot. And uh, we find Elijah now very disheartened after all of this had taken place. So he's talking to God, and he says this. He says, Lord, they have killed your prophets and demolished your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to take my life. But what was the divine reply to him, Paul asks? I have reserved for myself 7,000 people who have not knelt to worship Baal. So it is, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if this is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of actions. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then does this mean? It means that Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking, but the select group obtained it while the rest were hardened. As it is written to this day, God has put them into a deep sleep. Their eyes do not see and their ears do not hear. Okay, now what's Paul talking about here? Paul is talking about the Jews. Many of the Jews refused to believe in Yeshua as their Messiah. So it says very clearly, Paul says that God has put them to sleep, in a deep sleep, and their eyes do not see, and their ears do not hear. So these are the, uh, the Jews that have been broken off of the olive tree. And they have been cut out of the olive tree because they do not believe in Yeshua as their Messiah. Let's continue on. And David says, let, there be, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a punishment for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and keep their backs forever bent. So I ask, they have not stumbled so as to fall, have they? Of course not. On the contrary, because of their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. Now let's just stop there for a minute. Paul says that the stumbling of the Jews has come to fruition so that the Gentiles can be included. And so that because of the Gentiles being included, it will make the Jews jealous so that they will come back to God so that he can graft them back into the tree. Let's continue. Now if, there is, now, if their stumbling means riches for the world, and if, they, what, if their fall means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full participation mean? I am speaking to you, Gentiles, because I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in the hope that I can make my people jealous and save some of them. For if their rejection results in reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance bring but, the li but life from the dead? If the first part of the dough is holy, so is the whole batch. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, if some of the branches have been broken off, he's talking about the Jews now that have been broken off who do not believe in Yeshua. And you, a wild olive branch, now he's talking, about, he's talking to the Gentiles. He says, now if you, a wild olive branch, have been grafted in their place to share the root of the olive tree, do not boast about being better than the other branches. So he's talking about the... Gentiles now, and he's telling them, yes, some of the Jews were broken off, uh, and those branches were broken off because of their disbelief, and you've been grafted in. But he says, don't boast about it, because if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying uh, to the Gentiles, he says, don't boast that you have been grafted into the olive tree. Remember that you are not the root. The root is Israel, and the root supports you. Very important, very important to remember. Let's continue. 
Then you will say, branches were cut off, so that I could be grafted in. And this is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. Once again, he's talking about the unbelieving Jews. But you, the Gentile, remain only because of faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he certainly will not spare you either. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment, and I want to look at that again. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he certainly will not spare you either. So, this kind of blows a hole in the once saved, always saved doctrine, doesn't it? The idea that once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. This, again, is another false doctrine, and I want you to hear what's being said here. Again, Paul is very clear about talking about this olive tree and how it's constructed and who the root of the olive tree is. Is the root of the olive tree the Gentile? No, it is not. It is Israel. And we have to remember, the Jews are, were just one tribe of Israel. How many tribes of Israel were there? There were twelve. Of course, the two kingdoms broke in half, the northern part being uh, the other uh, 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 11 tribes, and uh, the Jews being the lower southern kingdom. So there were two kingdoms uh, going on during the split of Israel. Uh, so the Jews are just one section or one tribe of the 12 tribes. Uh, so we need to kind of keep that in mind as well. Let's continue. Consider then the kindness and the severity of God, his severity towards those who fell but God's kindness towards you, if you continue receiving his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Okay, let's take a look at that real quick. Again, this is an absolute, uh, absolutely destroys the once saved, always saved doctrine. So I want to read that one more time. He says, consider this. He says, the kindness and the severity of God, his severity towards those who fell, but God's kindness towards you. What does he say? If if you continue receiving his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Again, once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. So I just wanted to kind of clear that up in the midst of this. So, if the Jews do not persist in their unbelief, Paul says, they will be grafted in again because God is able to graft them in. So can he regraft the, the Jews that are lost? Yes, he can, and he will. And then he continues. He says, After all, if you were cut off from what is naturally an olive tree, a wild olive tree, contrary to the nature, uh, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much easier it will be for these natural branches to be grafted back into their own olive tree. Again, he's talking about the fallen Jews who have fallen away and had did not believe in Yeshua. Once they come to the truth of the knowledge of who their Messiah is, he will, they will be grafted back into that tree. Let's continue. He says, For I want to let you know about this secret, brothers, so that you will not claim to be wiser than you are. Stubbornness has come to part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles comes to faith. So what he's saying here is that stubbornness has come to Israel until the full number of Gentiles comes to faith. In this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. Again, he's talking to the, the Gentiles now, and he says that the Jews are enemies for your sake. But, he says, as far as election is concerned, they are loved for the sake of their ancestors. For God's gifts and callings never change. For just as you disobeyed God in the past, but now have received his mercy because of their disobedience, so they too, the Jews, have now disobeyed. As a result, they may receive mercy because of the mercy shown to you. For God has locked all people in the prison of their own disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, how deep are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge! How unfathomable are his decisions, and unexplainable are his ways! Who has known the mind of the Lord? 
or who has become his adviser, or who has given him something only to have him pay it back. For all things are from him, by him, and for him. Glory belongs to him forever. Amen. So once again, there is no real Christian who is not a Jew, and there is real, no real Jew who is not a Christian. Paul tells us very clearly in Galatians 3.28. He says, Because all of you are one in the Messiah Jesus. A person is no longer a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a free person, a male or a female. And if you belong to the Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants indeed and heirs according to the promise. And again, just a few verses back in the same book of Romans, Paul tells us this in Romans 10.12. He says, there is no difference between Jew and Greek, because they all have the same Lord, who gives richly to all who call on Him. So, we can conclude that all these Catholic Church fathers, like Martin Luther and Justin Martyr and Tertullian and Eusebius, were all wrong concerning their anti-Semitic trash-talking theology. Not to say they were wrong in, in everything, but it should be clear that if these historical men, who were called church fathers, and are so highly esteemed by so many people today, can be wrong, then there's a lesson to be learned here. When we get away from the scripture of the Bible, and we think in our own carnal minds that we know best, and we begin to let our own prejudices rule our carnal thinking, we are easily led astray by our adversary who is prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. If these prejudiced men, or prestigious men, uh, who were so well revered, can, uh, can all be wrong, and they can all be led astray, we also are in danger of our adversary's deceptions. And therefore, we need to put on the full armor of God written about in the book of Ephesians 6.10. The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. These things will help us to stand in the evil day, which is today. The Word of God should be read daily. And this does not mean that going to church and sitting in Sunday worship service and uh, listening to whatever a man behind the pulpit says and just believing everything without question is following God, because it is not. Once again, Matthew 23, 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be, what? Your servant. And he whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Is that clear enough for us to understand? We are commanded, each and every one of us, to study to show ourselves approved. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Yeshua commands all of us to accountability. In the end, we won't be able to stand in front of God and say, Pastor Bob or Pastor Mike or Pastor Sue or Betty or Tim told me this or told me that. We won't be able to blame our, our ignorance on anyone else but ourselves. We, who preach the word of God and its truth, should be encouraging everyone not to believe a word that we say without checking it out for themselves. Because in the end, I cannot save you, not with any teaching, not with any mercy or grace or salvation of my own. There is one name given under heaven or upon the earth by which men can be saved. And that name is Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek. And there is no other. And any man who builds himself up to be exalted will be brought low, and they will be humbled. But he that is greatest in the kingdom will be your servant, not your father, not your master, not your savior. Oh, but Pastor V... I know my pastor. I've known him all my life. And he's a good man. And I just know that he's right. My whole family has served in his church for generations. If you have checked the fruits of this man and have studied to show your own self approved, and if you have found no variation from the truth that he preaches, then good. He is acceptable and a good man of God. 
But if you haven't even read your Bible for yourself, how can you say your church leader is just preaching the truth in the eyes of God? How can you know the fruits of this man that you're listening to and trusting with your salvation and with the salvation of your family if you don't even know the Bible and the Scriptures for yourselves? Patent leather shoes, a three-piece suit, and leather and a leather-bound Bible are exactly what a wolf in sheep's clothing looks like. In the end, it's not commanded that we bow down to a church father or a pastor or a man on earth. We have one Father who is in heaven and one Master who is the Christ. There is no other. Knowing these things will keep us under the blood of the Messiah and the grace and the mercy of His salvation. Always wearing the full armor of God for ourselves will help us to stand in the evil day. It doesn't say, hide behind your pastor's armor or let the pastor wear the armor. You can't outrun our adversary. The day that we think we can outrun a lion is the day we lose our salvation. We need to put on the full armor of God. Protect your salvation. Because without your salvation, you can't teach others how to save theirs. Replacement theology is just another man-made doctrine created to lead the body of Christ away from God and to create division among His people. One of the most important things to remember is that the Old Testament often includes Gentiles and even in the lineage of Jesus there were Gentiles. Remember Ruth, a Moabite woman, a Gentile, who returned to Bethlehem with her mother and her, her, her mother-in-law, I should say, Naomi, who was a Jew. And Ruth, who was a Gentile, said, Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Ruth, who was a Gentile, became the great-grandmother of King David. So remember, even in the lineage of Jesus, there were Gentiles. Clear back in the book of Exodus, Gentiles were included in the Israelites if they chose to follow them and they were grafted into the tree. Clear back in the book of Exodus, we can find this. So we can know through this scripture, as well as many others in the Old Testament, that the Israelites included both Jews and Gentiles, even before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gentiles who knew God were grafted into the Israelites, clear back in the Old Testament, as far as the book of Exodus. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. Romans 9.24 Even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Romans 9.25 As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not beloved beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of God. 1 Corinthians 12.13 For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Galatians 3.28 there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you all are one in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3.6, the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and follow partakers of the promised in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Through these and other scriptures, we can know and understand that there is no replacement going on here. We are all one people joined together through the faith and the mercy and the grace of God and the salvation of His Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ in the Greek. One thing that we do need to know and to understand is that not everyone who is a natural descendant of Israel according to their flesh will be saved. Paul tells us this very clearly in Romans 9.6. He says, For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. In other words, just because you're a natural-born descendant of Israel, 
or the Jews does not mean that you're part of the body of Christ. doesn't mean you're a real Jew and including uh, uh, and included in his salvation. You must accept him as your Messiah in order to be counted as part of the body. And no matter Jew nor Greek will be part of the same olive tree if you believe in the salvation of Yeshua. So there we have it. Replacement theology. Debunked, dethroned, and destroyed by the word of God and the truth of his unfaltering word. If you don't have Yeshua in your life, you'd better get yourself into the olive tree in a hurry. The time is nearer now than when we first believed, and the days are short, and the hour is near. Don't allow yourself, your family, and your children to be left out in the cold. There's no sense in it. Come now and take the greatest gift ever given while you still can. I'm Pastor V. I'd like to thank you so very much for spending your time with me here today, and I pray that the grace and the peace of God would be with you and your family and the protection of God also. I'll be looking forward to seeing you on the next seventh day, Sabbath. God bless.